everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Axon Regeneration in the CNS, Insights from the Optic Nerve, presented by Larry Benowitz, PhD, Professor of Neurosurgery and Ophthalmology, Harvard Medical School, Neurosurgical Innovation and Research Endowed Professor, Boston Children's Hospital. I am Christina Mahalik of Labroots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots. Labroots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen or use the Ask a Question box and let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now please join me in welcoming Dr. Benowitz. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Dr. Benowitz, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christina, for the introduction. So uh, I'll be talking today about um, ways to get um, connections in the central nervous system to rewire themselves after injury. So the inability of the central nervous system to rewire itself has been known for a very long time. This papyrus dates back uh, to 1550 uh, BCE, uh, and it describes teachings that go back more than a thousand years before that. So the Grand Vizier of Egypt, Imhotep, um, um, extended these teachings about 2700 BCE, in other words, 4,700 years ago. So what's listed here are a number of uh, diseases, a number of uh, medical conditions, and the treatments that are prescribed for them. Uh, but at one point, he is describing what happens if there's injury to the spinal cord. And as you can see from the text, if you examine a man with a neck injury, find he was without sensation in both arms and both legs, unable to move them, he is incontinent of urine, it is due to the breaking of the spinal cord caused by dislocation of a cervical vertebra. This is a condition which cannot be treated. So in the ensuing 4,700 years, unfortunately, we are still not at the stage where we can effectively treat spinal cord injury, but we're making great advances. And so the model that we have chosen to study this question about CNS repair is the optic nerve. So first let's talk about why it is that the central nervous system cannot repair itself. First, we know that the brain has a very limited capacity to replace neurons that have become, that have died. Um, this can happen to a small extent and of course, there normally is neural replacement in certain parts of the brain, uh, the dentate gyrus, the olfactory uh, bulb, but in general, um, this doesn't happen. Secondly, um, the neurons that have had their axons severed, though the cell bodies may remain, uh, neurons cannot regenerate their axons over any kind of appreciable distance. In addition, Neurons that were not damaged themselves or neurons that had their axons uh, damaged at some distance from the cell body have only a very limited capacity to form collateral connections that could form, uh, that could be the basis for compensatory circuits. So uh, what I'll be talking about of these topics is specifically the issue of axon regeneration. So this doesn't happen for several reasons. One is that we know that after development, neurons lose their intrinsic capacity to extend axons uh, vigorously. This happens, of course, when the brain is developing, but not 
uh, in maturity. Secondly, trophic factors that might be effective in promoting growth. Uh, we know several instances where levels of those have gone down. If the trophic factors are provided, we can to some extent uh, promote regeneration. Third, there are many cell extrinsic molecules that suppress axon growth. These are molecules associated with the scar that forms at an injury site and with uh, the myelin debris that's deposited. And we know a number of the molecules associated with the scar and with myelin debris that are strong suppressors of axon growth. Um, in addition, some neurons die after their axons are injured. And finally, from our own recent work, we know that um, zinc, which normally is present in all cells and is essential for biological functioning, when the zinc is liberated and becomes uh, uh, concentration becomes high, zinc in a mobile or ionic form, that can become highly toxic to cells. So as I mentioned, our work focuses on the optic nerve and why would one focus on this system rather than, for example, the spinal cord? Of course, both are very important functionally. Um, for one thing, the optic nerve is the most accessible part of the central nervous system. Though the optic nerve sits outside of the brain, it actually is part of the brain itself. Both the retina and the optic nerve are part of the brain itself. We know the anatomy, the connections from the eye to the brain very well. And of course, functionally, this is a, a very important system. Secondly, um, it turns out that m many or maybe most of the mechanisms that have been discovered in this system have turned out to be highly relevant to the spinal cord and other parts of the CNS. So the optic nerve has really served as kind of a discovery platform for understanding why regeneration fails and discovering ways that we can uh, reverse that, uh, that failure. So Cajal, uh, the great proto-neuroscientist, uh, himself used the optic nerve as a model system to study CNS regenerative failure. So this, is, this uh, image on the, uh, on the right comes from Cajal's um, magnum opus, his third magnum opus, after describing the histology of the nervous system, the development of the nervous system, he turned his attention to injury to the central nervous system. And here he's showing uh, an example of an optic nerve. You could imagine the retina up to the uh, right and, uh, and uh, up. And um, here he's showing at the injury site using the Golgi stain, which impregnates um, just a small fraction of all cells and their uh, entire dendritic tree and axons. What he's showing at the injury site is that the damaged axons form these retraction bulbs. Uh, they can show kind of what he calls a frustrated um, axon growth, uh, reformation of growth cones, but it doesn't go anywhere. So um, this, of course, is paradigmatic to uh, what happens throughout the entire nervous system. Um, I found this very nice uh, image of Cajal and his students on the web. And uh, this person here, uh, Teo, um, was the person who carried out the following experiments. So what Teo did was to um, sever the optic nerve, and of course there would have been no regeneration through the uh, native environment of the optic nerve itself, but what he uh, reasoned was that since regeneration does occur in the peripheral nervous system, maybe regeneration has something to do with the extracellular environment that the axons are growing through. So what he did was to essentially swap out the, uh, remove the optic nerve distal to the injury site and substituted the animal's own sciatic nerve, a fragment of the animal's own sciatic nerve. And astonishingly, some of the damaged axons here at the injury site grew right into the sciatic nerve graft. And this uh, line of investigation was then pursued uh, aggressively by Aguayo and his colleagues in the 1980s, 1990s. Aguayo was at the Montreal uh, Neurological Institute, McGill University. And um, this, uh, these studies um, carried out in much, uh, much greater detail and much more systematically uh, this basic paradigm. So you damage the optic nerve just behind the eye, and then you affix to the cut end of the optic nerve a autologous graft of the animal's own sciatic nerve. So this is threaded up over the brain and targeted down into the superior colliculus. 
one of the primary target areas that the retina would normally innervate in the brain. And what was found is that a few percent of the retinal ganglion cells were able to grow axons all the way through this peripheral nerve graft and form the synapses here in the superior colliculus. So this was really a big deal. This was really the first systematic demonstration that you can get some degree of regeneration, of axon regeneration in the central nervous system. And studies like this were carried out by uh, Aguayo and his colleagues um, in the spinal cord uh, and uh, in other parts of the central nervous system. And indeed, this held up. So why is it that neurons are able to regenerate axons, at least to some extent, uh, through the environment of the peripheral nervous system, but not in the environment of the central nervous system itself. Uh, and so this question was picked up by Martin Schwab, who uh, has become one of the, uh, the world leaders in the, in the issue of uh, neural reorganization, CNS regeneration, uh, effects of, uh, of activity on axon growth. But in these experiments uh, published in 1988, what, uh, what Schwab and his colleagues did um, Schwab and Caroni in this case, um, was to take neurons uh, from the superior cervical ganglion, peripheral neurons, uh, peripheral sympathetic neurons, and grow them in a dish in the presence of either oligodendrocytes, the glial cells of the central nervous system that form, uh, that form the sheath around axons, the myelinating um, glia of the central nervous system, compared to either astrocytes in this case or compared to peripheral nervous system sheathed cells, that is, Schwann cells. And if we look down at the bottom first, what we see is that these neurons, they're, um, this is a phase contrast image, are extending their axons happily over the environment of a, an astrocyte. You would see the same thing if, grow, if they were allowed to grow over a Schwann cell, whereas if put in the environment of these oligodendrocytes, the myelin-forming glia of the central nervous system, the axons assiduously avoid uh, these, um, these type of glia, the oligodendrocytes, the CNS uh, oligodendrocytes. So this was an, a very important uh, discovery that the glial environment of the central nervous system is inhibitory to axon growth, whereas uh, astrocytes or the glial environment of the peripheral nervous system are supportive to growth. Um, and subsequent to that work, Schwab's lab, Steve Strittmater, um, a number of other investigators, Jigan He, my neighbor here, Children's Hospital, uh, the late Marie Philbin, uh, Lisa McCarricker, um, Jerry, Jerry Silver, um, many others, contributed to this uh, discovery of the uh, molecules associated with myelin and molecules associated with the scar that forms at an injury site that are responsible for suppressing axon regeneration. So we know that myelin has associated with it uh, proteins called NOGO, uh, myelin-associated glycoprotein, oligodendrocyte myelin glycoprotein. Uh, these act upon some common receptors, shared receptors, as well as their own distinct receptors. Um, and these receptors, in turn, um, convey a signal uh, intracellularly that converges, in general, converges on this small GTPase called Rho A, and uh, signaling through Rho A, in turn, activates other downstream um, signals, leading to the collapse of growth cones and the arrest of axon growth. Um, the, the scar that forms at an injury site, some of the primary molecules associated with this inhibition are keratin sulfate proteoglycans and chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans, they also act upon multiple receptors. What's shown here is one of their receptors, PTP sigma, but they also act on the NOGO receptor, as Roman Geiger's group found. And so the damaged axon has lots and lots of impediments to regeneration. We know several ways to overcome these impediments. We know that introducing the bacterial enzyme C3 ribosyltransferase causes Rho A to undergo a uh, an irreversible change. So essentially, Rho A is knocked out, which comprehensively counteracts many or all, perhaps, of these extracellular suppressors of axon growth. And then other people, including Jigang He, my neighbor here, uh, developed the dominant negative form of the NOGA receptor, 
that will bind all of these ligands, but parts of it are missing, so it doesn't convey a signal, a downstream signal to activate Rho A. So in cell culture, either introducing C3 ribosomal transferase or introducing a dominant negative form of the NOVA receptor allows neurons to extend axons, provided you um, supplement the culture medium with appropriate trophic factors. However, in vivo, that is not sufficient to cause any kind of regeneration. So here, I'll introduce the optic nerve model. Uh, these are parts of longitudinal sections of the optic nerve. The injury site is shown with the asterisk over here. The sections are stained with antibodies to the growth-associated protein, GAP43. And what you see here is that at the site of axonal injury, this is a crush of the optic nerve. So we see some GAP43 positive nerve terminals accumulating at the injury site, <clears throat> not much, and absolutely no growth extending beyond, beyond the site, um, as would be expected from the early work going back to Cajal and Aguayo and, and many, many others. If we introduce a gene encoding the dominant negative form of the NOVA receptor uh, into, the, into the projection neurons of the retina, the retinal ganglion cells, this too is insufficient to cause any kind of appreciable regeneration. Or if we in, uh, introduce the C3 enzyme, again using a virus, uh, AAV, adeno-associated virus, encoding the C3 ribosyl transferase, this too does not give us regeneration. So this is essentially telling us <coughs> then that counteracting the cell extrinsic suppressors of axon growth in general is not sufficient to give us regeneration. So why is this? And of course, one reason is that we've done nothing at this point to activate the intrinsic growth capacity of, of the damaged neurons. So one could imagine that the experiments of counteracting the cell extrinsic suppressors of axon growth would be like trying to drive a car by taking your foot off the brakes. And of course, that's helpful, but it's not helpful unless you also step on the gas. So a very important discovery was made by Martin Berry, uh, who was working in London at the time. This is a paper published over 20 years ago. Uh, and what Berry did, he, he had a different take on those uh, experiments, the peripheral nerve graft. His reasoning was that perhaps the, reason, perhaps the reason that these peripheral nerve grafts were causing the uh, damaged neurons to regenerate their axons was that these peripheral nerve grafts might be putting out some kind of sub, uh, trophic factor that stimulates the retinal ganglion cells, and that's the key to getting them to regenerate axons. So what, what Berry did here was to damage the optic nerve, uh, the crush sites shown over here, and in control conditions, of course, he gets no axons regenerating uh, distal to the injury site. These are, this is debris shown over here. He speckles, but no continuous uh, axons extending beyond the injury site. This is also with GAP43 uh, immunostaining. However, uh, he saw something remarkable when he put a fragment of peripheral nerve into the back of the eye. And what happened here was that suddenly he got lots of axons regenerating beyond the injury site. So this was a really exciting finding. This was the first evidence of uh, extensive regeneration in the central nervous system through the environment, through the native CNS environment itself. And of course, um, Barry's take on these studies was that the cells of this peripheral nerve graft, presumably the glial cells, the Schwann cells, the ensheathing cells, were producing some trophic factor that stimulated axon growth from the, uh, from the damaged neurons, the damaged retinal ganglion cells. So our group got into this, uh, into this area about this time. We were previously studying optic nerve regeneration in lower vertebrates. Um, fish, frogs are able to regenerate their optic nerve spontaneously throughout life. We were trying to understand how they did that, but um, in, in those studies, we were uh, taking the retinal ganglion cells, the uh, projection neurons of the retina of fish, growing them in culture and trying to understand what it was that enabled them to regenerate their axons. So from that work, we identified some um, active molecules uh, and we tested them uh, based on Berry's findings that there, there's something that's producing regeneration. We tested them in the mouse. It, our first studies were done in the rat. 
uh, in the case of the uh, rat optic nerve injury. So um, as many people before us had found, you injure the optic nerve and you get no regeneration distal to the injury site. And then starting a couple of days after injury and extending through the next month, the proximal portions of the damaged axons die, as do the cell bodies themselves, the retinal ganglion cells, um, precluding any possible possibility of recovery. We then uh, tried to see what happened when we injected this molecule that we were studying in lower vertebrates. And what we found in that case, we injured the optic nerve, made our intraocular injections, and to our surprise, we discovered that these injections um, caused the retinal ganglion cells to go into an active growth state and begin regenerating their, um, their axons, just as Martin Berry had found. However, to our uh, initial disappointment, what we found is that even our control injections did the same thing. So this was uh, kind of distressing. But we then went on to find that um, what we hadn't appreciated was that unlike humans, the lens of the mouse or the rat eye is very large. And so if we weren't careful in our injections, we would nick the lens. This itself causes an inflammatory reaction. And that turns out to be the key. Um, just causing this inflammatory reaction, this influx of cells from the innate immune system is in fact the trick to get intraocular uh, activation of the retinal ganglion cells uh, in a paper we published in 2004, Deep Mark Fisher is first author, we found that these kinds of intraocular injections in, were causing the retinal ganglion cells to revert to an active growth state and turn on genes like GAP43 and others that are associated with active axon growth. And along with that, they extend their axons through the, uh, through the optic nerve. So we then went on to uh, grow inflammatory cells in a dish, collected the proteins that they secrete into the uh, medium. And from that work, um, Yu Chin Yin in my lab uh, discovered a novel growth factor called oncomodulin. Uh, it's a small calcium binding protein, never previously known to be made by inflammatory cells, never previously known to stimulate axon growth. So here we're staining these cells, these uh, inflammatory cells taken from the uh, eye after inducing inflammation, in this case using a substance called zymosan uh, without injuring the lens. Um, these uh, cells we're looking at here are the neutrophils, the first responders of the native immune system. And what we see is that the neutrophils are making very high levels of this protein that we identified as protein oncomodulin. Um, if we look at the retina by immunostaining, what we see is that the normal retina shows almost no oncomodulin, whereas after inducing intraocular inflammation by zymosan, we get very high levels of this protein. We see the same things at the, uh, at the mRNA level, almost no oncomodulin mRNA uh, found in the normal eye, whereas after inducing inflammation, uh, levels of the message go sky high. And then in gain-of-function experiments, uh, carry out... Um, uh, in collaboration um, with lab at MIT. We packaged these um, uh, oncomodulin. Uh, we also found that oncomodulin, in order to be effective, required elevation of cyclic AMP. Um, the elevation of cyclic AMP causes the um, oncomodulin receptor, the uh, receptor for oncomodulin or ret retinal ganglion cells, uh, it causes that receptor to translocate to the cell surface so oncomodulin can uh, exert its effect. So these experiments were done together with Bob Langer from MIT. And what we found is that unlike the control condition, when we injected beads uh, that, that uh, slowly released oncomodulin in a cyclic AMP analog, we got the same result as Martin Berry. You got this extensive axon regeneration distal to the injury site. And here in loss of function experiments, uh, Yuchin discovered that a small peptide representing the N-terminal of oncomodulin acts as a, uh, an antagonist. It uh, prevents the native molecule from binding. And so you can cause intraocular inflammation, introduce this uh, small peptide antagonist of oncomodulin, and get no regeneration. So this is telling us then that this protein, oncomodulin, is being made by inflammatory cells and is a very potent stimulator of axon growth. What we also discovered was going back to Martin Berry's uh, original paper, 
um, he reported that his um, grafts that he had put into the back of the eye were in fact filled with inflammatory cells. And subsequent to this point, I think that Barry has come to feel also that his discoveries are due to inflammation, the uh, induction of, a, of an inflammatory reaction in the eye. Of course, this isn't something that can be used clinically, but molecules like oncomodulin delivered either through slow-release polymers or by viral gene delivery are turning out to be, uh, to be quite effective in animal models. So now when we combine the, uh, the treatments that I mentioned before, the dominant negative NOGO receptor or the C3 ribosyl transferase to inactivate that um, row A, that common signaling element um, that all or, or most um, extracellular suppressors of axon growth converge on. This is the same uh, material I showed you before, but if we now activate the intrinsic growth state of, um, of the retinal ganglion cells, we're able to get so much regeneration uh, down the optic nerve that we can't even find the injury site any longer. So this is a combination of inducing intraocular inflammation plus um, introducing that uh, C3 protein into retinal ganglion cells to inactivate row A. Um, so at about uh, a little after um, we published that work, uh, Jigong He, my neighbor here at Children's Hospital, uh, made a very important complementary discovery, and that is that another way to get extensive axon regeneration was to tinker with the uh, internal state of retinal ganglion cells. So we were essentially causing regeneration by introducing a, uh, a trophic agent, oncomodulin, and uh, that we had found partially activates several of the most important um, signal transduction pathways in the cell. It activates the so-called PI3 kinase pathway um, that, that in turn activates AKT and important downstream molecules. It activates the uh, MAP kinase signaling pathway, and it may also activate the so-called JAK-STAT signaling pathway. So um, this oncomodulin is acting through multiple um, cell pathways to cause axon growth. But what Jigong He's group discovered uh, um, Kevin Park was the first author of that paper, was that um, the, the, these signaling pathways still have important breaks on them. Um, so as neurons develop, they are upregulating um, suppressors of axon growth, cell internal, cell intrinsic suppressors of axon growth. So these take the form of P10, best known as a tumor suppressor gene, P10 suppresses cell signaling through the um, PI3 kinase AKT pathway. And what uh, Park and, uh, and Jigan He found was that if you delete the gene for, P for P10 in retinal ganglion cells, that will cause about the same amount of axon regeneration or maybe a little more axon regeneration than oncomodulin plus elevation of cyclic AMP. But we asked the question, what happens if we combine these treatments? In other words, uh, delete the P10 gene and introduce intraocular inflammation or introduce oncomodulin plus elevated cyclic AMP. So one po possible outcome could have been that these are just overlapping with each other. You won't get any more regeneration than either one alone. Or perhaps there would be some additivity or even synergy in the sense that the oncomodulin is partially activating cell signaling pathways that still have breaks on them. But if you then remove the P10 gene, you might get some kind of additivity or synergy, synergy. And in fact, what we found was a remarkable synergy between these two treatments, um, causing about 10 times more axon regeneration than either treatment alone. And so here now with our injury site, remember the normal state would be no axon regeneration whatsoever distal to the injury site. Here we're staining the regenerating axons uh, with, with red using an anthrograde tracer. And what we're seeing is lots of regeneration, regenerating axons all the way down at the end of the optic nerve. And what we find is that some of these axons uh, become myelinated, meaning they're able to conduct signals efficiently. Um, this, this part of the work was all headed by Silmara de Lima, who did fabulous work and is now still in the lab, continuing with uh, some of these questions. Um, and in addition, um, some of these axons 
navigate to the appropriate target spots. So here we are in the dorsal lateral geniculate nucleus and some of the regenerating axons, here are their terminals in red in the dorsal lateral geniculate nucleus. And we can double stain these terminals uh, with antibody to the vesicular glutamate transporter, VGLU2, a marker for the terminals of retinal ganglion cell axons. And we're seeing that these axons are in, form, in fact forming synapses. And we have a little bit of evidence that um, some functional recovery is taking place um, but not a great deal. So here is Silmara and Yoshiki Koriyama, who was the second author of this paper. And I should also mention uh, Takuji uh, Kurimoto, um, who worked on uh, this and earlier stages of the combinatorial treatment in the lab. So this was good news in the sense that we could get some axons regenerating the full length of the, act of the optic nerve and, and re innovating the target areas. But the bad news was that the extent of regeneration still remained very low. Um, maybe 1% of all the retinal ganglion cells were successfully regenerating down the optic nerve, and just a percentage of those were innervating central targets. So the question then is, why is it that most of the retinal ganglion cells are not uh, regenerating their, their axons down, down the optic nerve? And at this point, um, I teamed up with my colleague, Paul Rosenberg, um, who is, is extremely knowledgeable in many areas of neuroscience, but he had also done some work on the biology of zinc, which I just mentioned briefly in the introduction. So why zinc? So we, we know that, as I mentioned, that zinc is present in all cells, neurons and all other cells. It's an essential part of protein structure. So many proteins, for example, zinc finger, so-called zinc finger, uh, transcription factors utilize zinc um, to um, allow the three-dimensional folding of proteins so that they're able to bind to their targets appropriately. Numerous enzymes contain zinc, uh, often in their catalytic site, again, allowing for the structural coordination and activity of, of the protein. Um, so that zinc is covalently bound to proteins. However, there is also um, a very, very low level of cell in, in cells of zinc that's in a unbound in an unbound state. Uh, that's called mobile zinc, or ionic zinc, or free zinc, and that zinc is held to very, very low uh, 10 to the minus 10 molar concentrations by an elaborate series of zinc transport proteins, zinc. Uh, import proteins, zinc buffering proteins. So the cell has very elaborate uh, molecular machinery to maintain zinc levels at appropriate levels. But one exception to that is in synaptic vesicles. And so it turns out that there is a protein called ZNT3, uh, the zinc transporter protein 3. Um, here is uh, just a little bit from a, a review article about the biology of zinc, the neurobiology of zinc. And this, uh, the, uh, the abstract uh, ends with this kind of uh, uh, humorous but, but really interesting quote. However, the number of normal biological functions, health implications, and pharmacological targets that are emerging to zinc indicate that it might turn out to be the calcium of the 21st century. So the point here is that while there has been so much attention focused on the neurobiology of calcium, uh, zinc is kind of coming up from behind, may not overtake a, a calcium, but extremely important for neural function. Uh, so the protein ZNT3, uh, illustrated here around a, uh, a synaptic vesicle, is the protein that transports zinc from the cell, cell cytosol, cytoplasm, into the uh, into synaptic vesicles uh, with a about a, um, let, let me think here, about a million fold concentration of zinc from the extracellular, from the uh, extra, extra vesicular space into synaptic vesicles. And that's illustrated here. And then the zinc in synaptic vesicles is co released with classical neurotransmitters like glutamate, goes out into the extracellular space, and normally, under normal circumstances, just modulates synaptic function. So zinc is actually regulating NFDA receptors. And it's essential for long-term uh, depression and plays a major role in long-term potentiation as well. So this is a normal part of synaptic physiology, the zinc that's co-packaged 
um, with glutamate or other neurotransmitters. But in pathological states, that zinc level can go into the, the zinc gets high, zinc levels become very high, go into the postsynaptic neuron and wreak havoc. And in fact, in a very important study uh, published in 1995 or 96 by uh, Jay Coe and uh, Dennis Choi showed, in fact, in hypoxic ischemic injury, um, it's the entry of zinc into the cell that is probably the primary culprit for causing cell death. And more recent studies uh, indicate that it's kind of a collaboration between zinc and calcium that's responsible for cell death uh, in, in stroke or hypoxic ischemic injury. So let's get back to the model up. But before that, let me just show you how much zinc there is in the brain. So it was known for a very long time that parts of the hippocampal formation, high, here in the high list of the hippocampal formation, uh, extremely high levels of zinc. Um, this zinc is visualized using a, uh, the reaction of the zinc when it becomes free, uh, when it's no longer covalently bound. Um, zinc is reacted with selenite that's introduced into peritoneal, intraperitoneally into the animals, forming this precipitate that's then enhanced by a silver reaction. So you see this extraordinary level of zinc, not only in the hippocampal formation, but throughout the neocortex. So all of this is representing zinc in um, synaptic vesicles, co-packaged along with glutamate. Um, here in the amygdala, caudate putamen, very little in the cerebellum, and then uh, many other brainstem structures. So let's go back to the retina now. So here we have um, one of the wonderful drawings from Cajal. Uh, showing the layers of the retina. I flipped this over because in our work, we typically show the projection neurons that send information out from the eye to the brain. The retinal ganglion cells we show up on top. So light comes here from the top, passes right through the retinal ganglion cells, passes through the interneurons, hits the distal segments of the rods and the cones, the photoreceptors. Signals from those cells then are passed along through their cell bodies onto the horizontal cells and the bipolar cells. The bipolar cells are the excitatory interneurons of the retina, and interposed in the circuitry are the inhibitory interneurons, the amacrine cells. The amacrine cells are extraordinary. There are thought to be 50 to 70 different types of amacrine cells, perhaps 40, 30 to 40 different types of retinal ganglion cells, maybe 15 types of the uh, uh, excitatory interneurons, bipolar cells. So there's extraordinarily precise circuitry. The retina itself is a computational device that's taking the photic information from that hits the photoreceptors, passes through this extraordinarily complex circuitry of the interneurons, and then projects this information onto the ganglion cells, which are then sending different channels of visual information uh, back to the brain through the through the optic nerve. I should mention uh, also that retinal ganglion cells themselves, maybe 10% of them, maybe it's higher than that, are intrinsically photo uh, photosensitive. And in addition to receiving information through the uh, well-known retinal circuitry, are themselves responding to the overall uh, illumination. And those cells are responsible for uh, regulating our circadian uh, activity uh, as well as the pupillary light reflex. Um, okay, so let's look at the retina after optic nerve, if the optic nerve is injured. Uh, so here we're visualizing zinc as, as shown in that previous image using the selenite reaction. Uh, and again, we're not looking at the covalently bound zinc uh, because our sensors, the zinc sensors, don't pick that up. It's too tightly bound to proteins. The sensors are only picking up zinc that becomes available in this mobile or free state. So the normal retina with ganglion cells up uh, shows very little zinc staining, a little bit in this so-called uh, outer plexiform layer where the uh, retinal interneurons receive inputs from the photoreceptors, um, but very little happening up here. So what, what did we expect after we injured the optic nerve? We might, we might have imagined that perhaps, level of, perhaps levels of zinc might go up in the damaged neurons in the retinal ganglion cells. And in fact, that's not what happened, but we were pretty astonished to see what did happen. So let me introduce here Eric Ching Li, who worked in the lab for five or six years and was absolutely spectacular. 
Uh, we've tried to chain him down, but he just went back to China and took an associate professor position uh, in, uh, in Guangzhou in the leading uh, uh, Eye Institute of China. Anyway, what, what Eric found, I should mention that all of this work was so supervised with Paul Rosenberg uh, and myself, uh, Steve Lippard at MIT, professor of chemistry, uh, who has done uh, spectacular work in um, inorganic uh, molecules uh, in biology, um, was co-author of this work as well. Um, and what we found then is that one day after injuring the optic nerve, we did not see zinc go up in the retinal ganglion cells, but we saw this extraordinary elevation of free or mobile zinc happening in the synaptic layer of the retina. This is where the retinal ganglion cell dendrites are receiving input from the interneurons. Uh, Steve Lippard's lab developed um, this wonderful fluorescent uh, zinc sensor that gives us better temporal and spatial resolution than this so-called photometallography, the selenite reaction. And with ZP1, what we're able to see is that the zinc uh, from this normally low level, here we're focusing specifically on this zone, the inner plexiform layer, the synaptic zone. Uh, the levels go up even within an hour. We have evidence that it goes up within a half hour. So that's probably earlier than any pathological change that's ever been described in the retina. So the uh, levels of zinc continue to rise here at six hours um, at one day, and then levels go down in the synaptic zone at two days or three days after injury, but the zinc then transits over and collects in the retinal ganglion cells themselves. Here in large is a retinal ganglion cell. We've done double staining and the various other ways to show that, uh, in fact, this is a retinal ganglion cell where the, where the zinc ends up. Um, here I'm introducing two chelators. These are um, small molecules that bind up zinc and remove it from the, uh, from the, from the, from the scene. So one of them is a, uh, a well-known zinc chelator, T-PEN, with an extremely high affinity to zinc over calcium. And this other one, ZX1, uh, also developed in the lab of Steve Lippard, has a, a high affinity for zinc, but no affinity for calcium. So um, those will come in in a moment. And again, bringing back ZNT3, the protein that transports zinc into synaptic vesicles, uh, what we see is that the normal retina here in this synaptic zone has only, only very modest levels of ZNT3, but one day after uh, inducing optic nerve injury, just as the levels of zinc go up, levels of the zinc transporter go up, and the two are interdependent of each other. So in other words, uh, as zinc goes up, um, levels of the ZNT3 protein go up, and that ZNT3 protein then is what enables that, that zinc to become sequestered in synaptic vesicles and subsequently exocytose to go over to the retinal ganglion cells. So what happens if we delete the gene for ZNT3? So here first are the wild-type littermates of animals that have the ZNT3 gene missing. These guys have the gene present. Um, and so they show the expected elevation of zinc here in the synaptic zone one day after optic nerve injury and the expected transit of zinc and accumulation of into the uh, retinal ganglion cells three days after optic nerve injury whereas with the knockout of the gene, both disappear. So the zinc it is still being elevated by upstream steps that I'll tell you about in a minute, but it's not sequestered in synaptic vesicles, and we're not seeing high accumulations, therefore, in this synaptic zone, nor are we subsequently seeing at three days uh, much accumulation in the retinal ganglion cells, some, but much less. Um, by double immunostaining for this um, zinc transporter proteins, we can, zinc transporter proteins, ZNT3, um, we can double stain for markers for different types of interneurons. And what we find is that the ZNT3 co-stains with uh, VGAT. VGAT is the vesicular GABA transporter that's found in the terminals of the inhibitory interneurons. So this is telling us that the initial accumulation of zinc is in the terminals of the inhibitory interneurons of the retina, the amacrine cells. So this is pretty surprising. What's, what's causing this to happen? Um, if we delete the ZNT3 gene, it turns out that that alone is enough to greatly increase the ability of retinal ganglion cells to survive after optic nerve injury. 
So normally after the optic nerve is injured, if we wait two weeks, we've lost about 80% um, of the retinal ganglion cells. That's shown here, only about 23% of the retinal ganglion cells surviving two weeks after optic nerve injury. But all we need to do is to knock out that trans the gene for that transporter protein, ZNT3, and we double the survival of retinal ganglion cells. And even more surprisingly, that alone gives us some optic nerve regeneration. So this is telling us then that this um, accumulation of zinc in the interneurons is one of the main reasons that retinal ganglion cells die after their axons are injured. And it's one of the reasons that retinal ganglion cells cannot regenerate their axons after the optic nerve is injured. We can also approach this pharmacologically. So I mentioned the chelators T-PEN and ZX1 before. And so we, here is the normal complement of retinal ganglion cells. Um, two weeks after optic nerve injury, the numbers of cells have gone way down. We have selective survival of some of these large cells. But the numbers, as you can see here, from here, go way down. And again, either one of these chelators, uh, T-PEN or ZX1, strongly increases the ability of the ganglion cells to survive. And looking at nerve regeneration, here's our negative control, the injury site, no treatment, no regeneration. And either of the zinc chelators causes extraordinary levels of axon regeneration. So this was discovered again by Eric I Ching Li, uh, the same paper, uh, reports all of that. So that was pretty remarkable and, of course, raises a number of questions. One is, why is this elevation of zinc causing the cells to die? Why is it suppressing axon regeneration? And what's happening here in the retina after we injure the optic nerve? Why is this zinc level going way up? So we know from previous work in the field that um, zinc, of course, uh, I'm sorry, that, that um, zinc can be liberated from a protein, metallothionine, that normally buffers zinc and other divalent cations. So nitric oxide or reactive oxygen species um, can react with metallothionine and displace the, um, the zinc that's bound to metallothionine, giving rise to ionic or free zinc. Nitric oxide itself comes through, is, is formed by the enzyme nitric oxide synthase. There are three forms of it. In the retina, the primary one is the uh, neuron-specific NOS, also called NOS1. And so NOS1 converts L-arginine to nitric oxide and citrulline. This nitric oxide then reacts uh, either by itself or perhaps it reacts with oxygen first to form peroxynitrite, reacts with the talithionines. It gives rise to this free zinc. Um, and so if we knock out the gene for nitric oxide synthase 1, neuron-specific NOS1, what we find here are the wild-type littermates, the expected elevation in the uh, retina one day after optic nerve injury, the elevation at three days in the retinal ganglion cells. We knock out the gene for NOS1, and we no longer see this zinc elevation. So this is telling us that the upstream step to zinc elevation is elevation of nitric oxide in the retina. Uh, and here in these lower panels, what you see is uh, using a sensor also from the Lipard lab, uh, a sensor for nitric oxide, free nitric oxide. You see that the normal control retina has only very low levels of nitric oxide. The nitric oxide center, sensor is called uh, FL2. It forms a copper complex. Uh, and this is kind of a, an amazing molecule. And so one hour after optic nerve injury, we see this extraordinary elevation of nitric oxide. Uh, one day after optic nerve injury, it persists. And then three days after optic nerve injury, it goes even higher uh, and then begins to decline at five days. So this nitric oxide then is responsible for the elevation of zinc that occurs in the retina post-optic nerve injury. We had imagined that perhaps the nitric oxide is a signal between the injured retinal ganglion cells and the, um, and the interneurons, and maybe that's how the zinc becomes elevated. The retinal ganglion cells uh, increase their production of nitric oxide, and that goes into the amacrine cells, causes the amacrine cells to release the zinc. Um, but in fact, that's not what happens. What we find by immunostaining uh, and also confirming work that had been reported by other people in the field before us, 
nitric oxide synthase itself is only found in aggregate cells. So this is telling us that there must be another upstream signal coming from the retina, from the retinal ganglion cells, activating this population of, um, of amacrine cells, giving rise to this burst of nitric oxide, giving rise to this elevation of zinc. Um, this confirms that the nitric oxide is in amacrine cells. This is a marker for amacrine cells, PAC6, whereas a marker for bipolar cells, BSX2, does not co-stain with, uh, with the uh, am with the uh, nitric oxide synthase. So if we delete the gene selectively in amacrine cells, we got uh, from Paul Huang at MIT, we got animals with a conditional deletion of the NOS1 gene. We crossed those with mice uh, expressing the, um, the Cree recombinase uh, enzyme to knock the gene out specifically in amacrine cells expressing uh, the vesicular GABA transporter. So here we've knocked out the gene. And what we find, of course, is if we knock out the gene in amacrine cells, we lose this elevation of zinc. So what we have to do is prevent amacrine cells from producing nitric oxide synthase, and we get this, um, this uh, loss of, of this zinc signal with a very dramatic increase in the survival of retinal ganglion cells. So let me go on to this, uh, this summary diagram. Uh, and what we're discovering is that there's this whole complex signaling circuit that's being established in retinal ganglion cells after injury to the optic nerve. So the optic nerve is damaged. Um, we're finding now that this is giving rise to a signal, a retrograde signal to the retinal ganglion cells. The retinal ganglion cells are undergoing kind of a storm that is changing the environment of the entire retina uh, it's causing glutamate to be released, not just from normal synaptic vesicle release, but also the glutamate transporter that normally accumulates zinc in glial cells and in excitatory into neurons. That glutamate transporter runs in reverse because of this ionic change in the retina, giving rise to an elevation of glutamate. That elevation of glutamate is activating NMDA receptors on those amacrine cells uh, that produce nitric oxide synthase. That, um, glutam that is causing an entry of calcium into those cells. Calcium combines with calmodulin, activates nitric oxide synthase, giving rise to this elevation, this burst of nitric oxide, which in turn is causing zinc to be liberated from metallothionines, and then over time, that zinc goes over to the ganglion cells and is one of the primary reasons, but perhaps not the exclusive reason, that the ganglion cells die and that ganglion cells fail to regenerate their axons after optic nerve injury. So an important discovery was made by Jeff Goldberg uh, and Ben Barris um, at the time working at Stanford University. Um, Jeff is now the chairman of ophthalmology at Stanford and one of the world leaders uh, in this whole field of retinal repair. Uh, and Ben was one of the greatest of all neuroscientists and tragically died just a few months ago. Um, so in this landmark paper, what they showed is that retinal ganglion cells during development um, have an ability to extend axons vigorously at early stages of development, coinciding with the time that the visual projections are first forming. And then at, uh, by postnatal day eight, this capacity has gone way down and you take these neurons, put them in a dish, and they show very little axon growth. So the extent of axon growth is mapped here as a function of developmental time. And so what Goldberg and Barris and colleagues found is that at, uh, during development, during embryonic development, that the cells are extending axons rapidly. That capacity goes way down postnatally. Um, what they, they asked the question of whether this loss of growth ability is intrinsic to the retinal ganglion cells, or is it due to interactions that occur between the retinal ganglion cells and other neurons of the retina that normally would start forming connections with the retina uh, at this early postnatal period? And to just make this uh, long story short, what they found is that the amacrine cells, the very cells that we discovered to uh, accumulate zinc and to suppress axon growth that way, uh, Goldberg found that the membranes of amacrine cells, so this is apparently a different phenomenon from the zinc, 
but just the me membranes of amacrine cells or in the whole cells of amacrine cells when mixed with retinal ganglion cells in culture will shut off the ability of retinal ganglion cells to extend axons. Whereas when retinal ganglion cells are mixed with all the other cells of the retina, retina here in the amacrine cell depleted uh, cultures, this does not suppress axon growth. So this was really an extraordinary finding, saying that the shutting off of these cells' ability to grow, to grow axons is not built in, but it's due to their interaction with amacrine cells. So what we did was to use a conditional cell deletion strategy to remove the amacrine cells from the retina of adult animals. And in brief, what Fanny uh, Chan Feng uh, in the lab has done recently was to put the receptor uh, for the diphtheria toxin, the so-called diphtheria toxin receptor, to genetically encode that in the cells of the retina and uh, throughout the body. And then that, that gene um, becomes activated. It has a stop code on that's removed when you, you cross those mice with other mice that are expressing a uh, Cree recombinase driven by a amacrine cell specific promoter. So it's a VGAT Cre crossed with the mice with the uh, inducible diphtheria toxin receptor. And then that diphtheria toxin receptor, uh, I'm sorry, so the Cre recombinase gets turned on. It's the so-called conditional Cre. It's, it's um, VGAT Cre. And then after that, it has a tamoxifen receptor. So when you introduce um, tamoxifen or the estrogen receptor, when you introduce tamoxifen, you turn on the estrogen receptor, activates Cre in those cells, Cre recombinase, and it deletes the stop codon that allows the diphtheria toxin receptor to be introduced. At that point, you then introduce diphtheria toxin, and what Fanny found is you get this amazingly selective loss of the amacrine cells as we had hoped. So this is the normal uh, complement of amacrine cells in the retina. And after this strategy, this conditional deletion of amacrine cells, we've lost 90% of all the amacrine cells. And we strongly reduce by about 90% the amacrine cell receptors that can be visualized with antibodies to either the glycine transporter or the GABA transporter uh, in the synaptic layer. And so what does removing amacrine cells do to retinal ganglion cells? And what we find is that this causes extraordinary regeneration. So what this is telling us then is that just removal of interneurons or removing the zinc that accumulates in interneurons prior to uh, optic nerve injury is a tremendously potent um, stimulus of regeneration. Or conversely, one could say, that the interneurons are major suppressors of cell survival and regeneration. So what have we learned from the optic nerve that can be applied to other parts of the central nervous system? Um, and so we know that uh, molecules like oncomodulin um, are also playing a role in the uh, so-called conditioning lesion effect in the peripheral nervous system and central nervous system from peripheral sensory neurons. Uh, Jigong He has discovered that uh, insulin-like growth factor 1 plus osteopontin, first discovered in the optic nerve system, also causes axon regeneration in the spinal cord. Um, I'll skip the other ones in, in the interest of time. Uh, we know that blocking cell extrinsic suppressors of axon growth um, can be partially effective, particularly when combined with other strategies. Um, this has been shown in the optic nerve and now has also been shown in other parts of the uh, central nervous system, including um, an activator of the, uh, the so-called mTOR pathway that I didn't have a chance to talk about today, but also activating the same pathway as P10 deletion, uh, various transcription factors that activate downstream programs of gene expression, a number that were discovered again in the optic nerve system were found to be effective in the spinal cord, such as KLF7, um, KLF4 and 9 from Jeff Goldberg's work. Uh, have been found to be important in, in suppress these are important suppressors of axon regeneration uh, in the optic nerve. Uh, blocking receptors to the cell extrinsic suppressors of axon growth um, is 
highly effective, again, when combined with uh, other strategies to promote growth. Increasing physiological activity at the labs of Andy Huberman and Kai Yu uh, have taken this idea, in this case, the, the idea goes from spinal cord work to the optic nerve, but this also increases regeneration in both systems. And now um, our discovery about the role of presynaptic zinc in suppressing regeneration, we're just starting to look at whether this can promote regeneration in the spinal cord. And, uh, and then this crazy idea about removing into neurons uh, will, should be tried in the central nervous, in the, in the brain and spinal cord as well. So in summary then, uh, we know that intraocular inflammation combined with elevation of cyclic AMP and P10 deletion enabled some retinal ganglion cells to regenerate their axons from the eye to the brain um, with the innovation of some central target areas and some simple visual responses coming back. And the primary effect of the intraocular inflammation is mediated by oncomodulin, but we know there are other molecules as well. Uh, the second point was about this elevation of zinc in the interneurons, uh, its packaging in synaptic vesicles and subsequent transfer to the retinal ganglion cells the deletion of, of ZNT3 gene or using zinc chelators um, enables injured retinal ganglion cells, about half of them, to survive long-term and it induces optic nerve regeneration. Um, that the upstream step to the zinc elevation is this burst of nitric oxide coming from other interneurons of the retina. Um, and uh, what I didn't talk about is that if we chelate the zinc, we uncover positive effects of nitric oxide that are actually that are actually contributing to regeneration. Um, and, then, uh, and then this final point about deletion of the uh, interneurons. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and thank the people in my lab who've done all of this work, uh, primarily Yu Chin Yin for the uh, early stages of isolating oncomodulin um, and other molecules associated with inflammation. Um, only here are people in the last five or ten years. They were earlier investigators from uh, some of the earlier work. Eric Yi Ching Li for the zinc work, Samara for the combinatorial treatment and full length regeneration, and other very important contributors to this work. Um, people who've worked on other projects in the lab on spinal cord injury, uh, the role of inosine, um, other uh, contributors from the laboratory, and then other collaborators, most importantly recently. Uh, Paul Rosenberg and all of the zinc and nitric oxide work and our earlier work in, um, in inosine, collaborators from other institutes, uh, particularly uh, Steve Lippard, and that went by too fast. And finally, thank our funding sources and thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Benowitz, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started with our first question of the day. Uh, this question asks, can regenerating axons form a topographic map of visual space onto the brain? So um, normal vision requires that, that the outside world gets represented in, in an orderly fashion onto the brain. And through the work of John Flanagan and others, we know the molecules that are responsible for the formation of this highly organized map of, of the visual world uh, into, into the brain. Um, and so the question is, can that be recapitulated during regeneration? And the answer is we don't really know yet. Um, clearly that's going to be important for visual recovery uh, if we're to recover any, um, uh, any kind of visual acuity. Uh, so far what we're seeing is that um, some axons will go back to their proper destinations and that's enough to drive some um, genetically encoded behaviors, but that's not the same as being able to make sense of objects in the outside world or being able to navigate in, in, a, in an environment. So that remains to be seen, and I think that's, that's kind of one of the uh, next frontiers in, in this field. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, can retinal ganglion cells that have died be replaced by stem cells? So this is another area of intense investigation. Um, up until two or three years ago, it had been very difficult to induce stem cells to differentiate into retinal ganglion cells. So whereas some successful cell replacement is occurring in other parts of the nervous system, um, this had been extremely difficult uh, in the case of the retina. Um, and, and I should also mention that this is not only important here where we have traumatic injury to the optic nerve, but it's very important clinically in the case of glaucoma and some other degenerative diseases where it is the retinal ganglion cells that are dying and that, that will need to be replaced. So several laboratories just in the last two or three years, the labs of uh, Jeff Goldberg, Don Zach, Tom Ray, uh, there may be others that I'm forgetting, um, have, have succeeded in getting some stem cells to differentiate into retinal ganglion cells and to get these cells to um, insert themselves into the retina and begin uh, forming axons. So this is uh, very hopeful that we may eventually be able to replace lost retinal ganglion cells. And uh, th there were really two strategies here. One is uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, and the other is using embryonic stem cells uh, from, the, uh, from the immature retina. So research is occurring on both fronts, and there's been a little bit of progress in both fronts. So, so this is looking very hopeful. Excellent, thank you so much. Our uh, next question asks, are there additional impediments to applying this research to human patients? Um, well, of course, one is the scale of the system. The, uh, the optic nerve in mice is um, maybe one centimeter total uh, from the eye to the brain. And of course, in humans, it's much, much, much higher than that, much, much greater than that. Uh, so we don't know that directly that we can scale up what we have found in, uh, in mice and rats, but we are getting involved along with a number of um, top colleagues uh, around the world um, trying to see if this research can be applied to, uh, to larger mammals. And uh, at this point, this remains a uh, kind of empirical question, but uh, it's, it's just now starting. And of course, this is an important uh, intermediate step in uh, being able to, um, to treat patients eventually. All right, thank you. Uh, based on time, looks like we have uh, time for one last question today. And this question asks, is zinc likely to contribute to the failure of neurons to generate axons in other parts of the brain, such as the spinal cord? Yeah, so um, this again is unknown. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really not been studied yet. So uh, just now, uh, Sherry Peterson, my group, uh, is starting to look at this question. What we know is that unlike the retina, which starts out with very, very low levels of free zinc and then shows this uh, elevation in, in free zinc levels after the optic nerve is injured, uh, the, the neocortex starts out with extremely high levels of mobile zinc. So even if injury doesn't cause this elevation presynaptically, very high levels of, uh, of ionic zinc are already sitting in the synaptic terminals of interneurons uh, in the cortex. And it will be very interesting to see if we chelate that zinc or knock out the ZNT3 gene, um, whether in fact we can increase the amount of uh, axon sprouting or axon regeneration we see after uh, injury to the spinal cord. So, um, yeah, this, so this too re remains to be seen. Well, thank you once again, Dr. Benowitz, for your presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through June of 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. For, uh, for now, that's all. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again here soon at LabRoots. Goodbye. Bye.